Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? Now, this is going to be a very important uh, session today. We're going to be talking about slavery. And of course, when we say the word slavery in the English language, it has its connotations. It has its uh, historical uh, kind of denotations and connotations. And it also has its definitions. And this is where we're going to start to jump straight into it. And I've sent everyone here a PowerPoint, which is on the group. Um, because the question is, of course, some people ask this very straightforward question. They say, what, why does Islam allow slavery? What is slavery? Or how do you define it? And this is actually a very difficult thing to answer. What is slavery in the, in the first place? In popular culture, for example, there's, there was a new film in uh, Hollywood that was released, relatively new, called Django Unchained. You know, I'm not sure if many of you have seen it or some, I'm not, I don't recommend, you know, to watch these kinds of things in particular. But this is just in popular culture. The reason why I'm referencing it is because in this film you had these kind of images which are horrific images. And when someone says slavery, you think of these horrific images. I think Will Smith made a film recently as well. I'm not sure uh, if it's out yet or not. I haven't, I haven't watched it, I haven't seen anything of it, but I've, I know that, that it's out there. And so when people say slavery in the Western imagination, these are the kind of images that come to mind. The, repre the popular representations in Hollywood of what you see in Django Unchained, and with Will Smith in the, in the new movie and this kind of whipping and racism and transatlantic slave trade. And if that is what is being referenced, I think we should just start off by saying, if that's what people mean, does Islam allow this kind of thing? No, it doesn't, of course. This, I mean, there should be no controversy here. Does Islam allow this kind of thing? What, whatever existed in the West for 400 uh, years, where they were bringing people for racial reasons, uh, supremacy reasons, and whipping them and hurting them and harming them, and raping them and uh, assimilating them, then there is no way Islam allows any of these things, actually. And in fact, I, I think, especially in the in, in in the dawah, we have to be we have to be cognizant of who we're talking to. Like, for example, a lot of talabat al ilm or students of knowledge, they know they understand there's something called arriq fil Islam. There's something called like, you know, indentured servitude or however however you want to translate it. Of course, there was buying and selling human beings, and that was allowed at one point in time. Of course, uh, that is part of the Islamic law. Now, yes, we're, we're going to go into that, and that, that's what this session is about. But that's not what people imagine when we're talking about slavery in the current age. When we have Black History Month, I used to be a history teacher myself. We have Black History Month, and we talk about the plight of slaves. We talk about uh, individuals that were taking, we, take, uh, we see pictures of people that were taking on, on the ships, you know, from Africa, West Africa to different parts of the world and, and, and put into cotton fields and, and forced to do all kinds of things. That's not what we're talking about. So clearly, and I think a lot of it is people, they know that this is a very embarrassing part of their history. In fact, I could even say this is the most embarrassing thing of Western history. And you're seeing different psychological responses across the political spectrum of how people are responding to this. For example, people on the f kind of right wing, alt right, they're responding with a little bit of deflection and a little bit of almost uh, kind of uh, indifference to the matter. But that was them and this is us and who cares? This kind of thing. People on the left are maybe sometimes overcompensating in the sense that, oh, I, I want to apologize to these people as if they have the committed the crime themselves. So we, we see extremes, almost psychological extremes on all sides of the political spectrum on how to deal with this issue because it is a very serious issue. And the question is, of course, if Western superiority is true, moral Western superiority and liberalism is true and liberalism says that equality for all, then how could you have this kind of thing happening in the American empire, if you want to call it that, or the British empire, when you also had liberalism, when you also had all these other things? How could you have those two things coexist at the same time? How could you have the founding fathers of the United States of America? How could you have those people actually own slaves, in fact? And not just own slaves, but then use and abuse them in the ways that we know on racial grounds. So this is the questions that people are asking. But then, equally, a question that people then ask is they try and deflect the, uh, the matter and they say, well, but what about Islam? Islam allows it, doesn't it? I was actually reading a book recently. It was uh, very interesting. It was from a guy called Giles, Giles Milton. I'm not sure if you've uh, ever seen or read the book. It's, he's, I think he's an alt-right kind of guy. I would call him an orientalist. And the book is called White Gold, actually. And it's about a person in the Alawi dynasty of Morocco. It's not the Alawis as in Shia, Shia, 
Alawi meaning it has the, you know, they have the, the lineage goes back to Ali radiallahu an, and they claim, you know, uh, that. And this man is called Mawla Ismail. I'm not sure have you, and has anyone heard of him? Uh, anyway, the, the point is this, is that he also had slaves, but they were white slaves. And a lot of them were from England, the United Kingdom as well. And that's why the book was called White Gold. And the book goes through this whole idea of like, you know, um, the, you know the, the efforts of the United Kingdom to try and get them to release the white slaves. And you can, you can kind of sense the disdain of the writer as he has to admit that, you know, there's, our guys were made into slaves as well. Or in, in, to be clear, our women were made into slaves. In fact, at one point in the book, he talks about the pleasure palaces. They call it, he says, this man has pleasure palaces. Apparently, they called him over here in the United Kingdom. And they were saying to him, like, um, you know, they had some parties and they had some, you know, some things going on. And he didn't even, it, you know, it says, he didn't even look that way. This man, Nora Ismail, has the most children in human history. Over 800 children. Oh, absolutely. Well, absolutely. 800 more. I, I don't know, but they say, they say he, there's, there is a dispute who has more children, him or Genghis Khan. But he's over 800 children of his own ch children, yani, because he had so many white slaves. Now, why am I mentioning this? The point is, is that Islam doesn't discriminate on the, the racial aspect. Okay, the racial aspect, both historically and legalistically, has never said we need to get black slaves or slaves from here or there or is it somewhere else. And where is Morocco strategically located? It's located in a place where it's in reaching distance to Europe and it's in reaching distance to Africa. Obviously, not everywhere is strategically located like that. I mean, you can swim to, to Spain from Morocco. I'm not sure if you guys... I mean, I wouldn't try it myself, but you can. It's, you know this, you're from Spain. You can, you can probably swim there yourself. I don't have the ability. I'd probably die, you know, on the way. Uh, but if I was on a boat... I mean, many people take the boat nowadays. I'm sure you did. Uh, <laughs> on your way to this country. Uh, before you saw asylum. Uh, <laughs> Eddie... <laughs> Anyway, the, the point is, is that when we talk about the Western experience of slavery, it's a very unique, <laughs> it's a very unique experience. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very unique experience, the Western experience with, with slavery. So when a Western person who's gone through Black History Month and has watched Django Unchained and seen all these things and he's asking you, does slavery exist in Islam? You've got to remember, that's his historical memory. That's his collective memory. That is... His, his consciousness, what he believe, what he understands from the word slavery. So if you say, yes, it does, in such an you know, open way, I think that's dangerous, actually. And I think that's harmful. And I think that's wrong. Why? Because his understanding culturally is not the, the, our understanding of indentured servitude and, and this is allowed. And, and we'll go through the hadith today. What kind of thing the Prophet ﷺ allowed or the Islam allowed? And don't forget, and I'll start with this, in fact, because people are saying, well, what are you talking about? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I remember this in university, Wallahi, I remember this very vividly. There was a man shouting, shouting. He was at one of our lecturers. He was doing history, actually. This was one of my, my first master's degree. And the guy was shouting. He said, there was no one in history that wasn't racist or something, you know, something like this, you know. And no one before this time that wasn't racist of some sorts. The, the fact that Islam is a religion and it's the only ancient religion of its kind. It's the only religion in the medieval period or the antiquity period that the let's say the leader of the religion actually made it clear that there is equality between races there's no other religion like that i mean imagine that for a second where i challenge any christian to get me one verse from the bible which tells us that uh, black people and white people arabs and non-arabs or jews and non-jews are equal what we find is actually the opposite. We find that Jesus is scorning a woman because she's a, she's a Gentile, not a Jew. In the, in the New Testament, this is not even the Old Testament. You don't find the same kind of attitude that you found with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Le fadla hadith, very famous hadith. There's no virtue over a black man, over a white man, a white man over a black man, Arab over a non-Arab, non-Arab over an Arab. This is the most inclusive, racially inclusive religion in the world. And you can't really argue against that. And so this is the point I'm making. The point, and this is why it's one of the most multicultural, if not the most multicultural religion in the world. Because people realize that. Now, this is the first point. 
for that reason, if someone were to come and say, I'm going to enslave this person because of their race, because they're black and because we have a superior race, as what we read, not just from the proletariat or from the lower classes, but from the bourgeoisie, from the elites, from the philosophers, from J.S. Mill, from those guys. Well, not to be fair, J.S. Mill was actually quite uh, racially inclusive. But people in the Victorian per period, for example, liberal philosophers, yes, they were making a racial, uh, racial uh, case. You know, uh, th there are book, many books talking about how even Darwin and scientific cases against a black man and so on. And so it's n Islam doesn't have this. This needs to be very, very clear. And you can't even make an argument against that point. You can't even make an argument against it. You can't say, no, Islam does uh, value, uh, what, you know, what it does diminish, you know, deprecate the black man or something. Absolutely. How could you can make that argument when in fact Islam is the only religion, you know, which allowed people from literally, you had Salman al-Rumi, uh, sorry, um, Salman al-Farisi, yeah? You had Bilal al-Habashi, and not just Bilal al-Habashi, you had many others, black people. You had people uh, from every place, and it wasn't like, oh, you're better than him because of this. Yani, so that's, this needs to be very, very clear. There's no argument there. But let's talk about slavery, because the first thing we're going to look at is um, definitions. The problem with definitions. There, and this is what Jonathan Brown and the Dawa, he's the only one who actually wrote a book about slavery, and it's okay. I don't think the book is the best, but it's not the worst. It's, it's a good book, you know. And he says that there's a problem with definitions. There's a problem with definitions. Um, with an all-encompassing definition. And he makes an interesting point. He said, just because there's a problem with definition, it doesn't mean that we can't talk about the issue. And he, this is something called the bold man fallacy. The bold man fallacy. When, when you think that there's a problem with definition, therefore you can't talk about the issue. Uh, this is fallacious reasoning. And the same issue applies with a riq. Because what do we mean by slavery? Now, if we look at the dictionary, like for example, the Cambridge Dictionary, it's the activity of legally owning other people who are forced to work and obey you. If from this perspective is what you mean, of course, there was a kind of indentured servitude where people were bought and sold in Islam, and this would apply. This would apply. This kind of thing would apply. With what, what, is, what would apply an ultimate obedience? Now, this is in some definitions. I mean, if you do an exhaustive search of all of the definitions in the English language, the Webster, this one, that one, Cambridge, Oxford, some definitions are more like, ultimate obedience, to ultimately obey, obey somebody. This is a kind of definition of slavery. From that perspective, from a theological perspective, of course we can't say that you're allowed to do that to a human being. Yani, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, There is no obedience to the creation and the disobedience to the creator. So the question is that, can someone ultimately, a human being, ultimately obey another human being? No. Because if those laws go against Allah's laws, that kind of slavery is prohibited Islamically. So there are forms of slavery which are unacceptable Islamically. Definitional types of slavery. This type of slavery of ultimate obedience is totally unacceptable in Islam. And in fact, it's the thing that Islam tells us, which is a defi the USP of Islam, is that we want to unchain... As I, I forget who said this, uh, the, w w which person of the seller said that we have come to free you from the, from the, from the slavery of the creation and, uh, and come into the ibadah of the, the ones who created the slaves. I can't remember who mentioned exactly that, that thing, but Islam is telling us clearly that what's happening is everybody else, and look at the ayah, for example, even better. Darab Allahu mathalan, rajulun. That Allah has put forward a method, put forward a parable of two kinds of men. One man, he has many slave masters, whereas another man has one slave master. Are the two the same? Meaning, the one who has one slave master is like the mu'min, the Muslim. 
the Muslim has one slave master because that one slave master is Allah, really and truly, the ultimate one that deserves the worship, that deserves that kind of slavery. That's why we call ourselves Ibad Ar Rahman or Ibad Allah because we worship Allah. In, in a worship is slavery, yani. This kind of worship, which is slavery, only is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a kind of worship which, or a kind of slavery, Islam prohibits completely. It's, it's actually shirk, if you think about it. Because if, you, if, if we're talking about slavery from the ultimate slavery perspective, then you're doing shirk with somebody. So it's why, that's why it's very important to ask, what do you mean by slavery? You can't just say, okay, we're Islam accepted, yes, whatever. Because the person has in their mind, slavery, maybe the person is a BDSM person. And they believe in, you know, this kind of worship things. Now they have people, that they're worshipping a dog, uh, in the face of a dog, I don't know, they, they worship. What are those things? And you don't know what the guy is thinking, what they mean by the word slave. Especially in the West, people have completely different ideas. So when you understand, when you ascertain, buying and selling, yes, yeah, so, yeah, human beings existed. Allowed at some points, yes, of course. Just like it was allowed in other parts of the world, and yes, pretty much every part of the world, though, in fact. Islam allowed that. But are we talking about uh, ultimate obedience? Absolutely not. In fact, that's what Islam, that's how you should answer. If we're talking about ultimate obedience, that only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what Islam is. That is Islam. Because when you say, yes, Islam allows slavery to human beings, the person's thinking, why should I put myself in such a religion? That's what they're thinking to themselves. Why would I want to be... Because think about it. They've been told to be liberal and free. You're telling them that your religion allows another person to be ultimately in control of you. You're going against every part of their inclination. You cannot package it in this way. It's too dangerous to package it in this way, in my opinion. So the definitional problem is, is an important one. Is, is there any, are there any questions at this point? So if someone asks you, does Islam allow slavery? You must, I think it's almost wajib. Yani, I don't say wajib from a fiqh perspective, but from a perspective of understanding the conversation, you must say to them, what do you mean by it? You have to uh, understand. Then they define it. If they decide it's buying and selling, okay, yeah, it happens. Working under you, yes. Having sex with a slave, as yeah, okay, we can go, we can get into that. Then we'll talk about the gender differences and like, these three things are basically the issues here. But if we're talking about ultimate obedience, then no, then we're clearly not. Okay, we'll go to the next. Importantly, here the Prophet Muhammad said in the Hadith by Abu Hurairah do not refer to anybody as my slave for all of you are the slaves of Allah rather you should refer to him as my young man Fataya, yeah the servant should not refer to anyone as my lord but rather he should refer to him as my master let me ask a question so why do you think this is significant based on what you've just said Abdurrahman, you haven't been here for a long time so tell us what you think why is it significant <coughs> I feel like the servitude that's mentioned in this particular hadith uh, distinguishes between ultimate servitude and the servitude that was permitted by Islam, which is obviously uh, being a slave to a certain extent, not ultimately obeying your master, which is not what obviously existed in the West. Okay, fantastic. So uh, you can make that point. What else can you say, Ali? What do you say? I'll say it goes with the, with the hadith that you mentioned about <clears throat> who's the true owner. Which is Allah, Allah the true owner of all of us And that in this dunya That this person is Like you said um, Not slave but Somebody that you own But in the ultimate sense we all belong to Allah I think it just makes that distinction with the other hadith that you mentioned Fantastic uh, There's an ayah of the Quran There's two riwayahs I don't know the Quran <laughs> I just know there's two khilas there. Now, it, which means, Allah is saying that Allah has put some of you above others in degrees. So that some of you can take others as workers, let's say. Or that they can be above you. Yeah, it's, it's like the... It's like the concept of leadership. Some people are leaders, they're natural leaders. Some people, they're just, they're just happy with following. 
uh, I mean, it's different qualities Allah has given um, when it comes to, like, for example, we know the men, the man in the household is the leader. Uh, but generally, among other men, you might have an individual who might, that man who's a leader in his house might have to follow that other guy's lead because he's good at in a specific field. So, yeah, I think I don't see anything wrong with that. And it goes with what you said, for example, maybe it can go to the issue of slave and his master, maybe. Absolutely. So, uh, you want to add to it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this is an important point because at the moment there's a lot of um, what 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 kind of I guess is bubbling underneath the surface in a lot of these like discussions is like these equality premises and or premises and um, there's a lot of equality discourse now, which basically wherever they wherever you see inequality, whether it be economic inequality or equality, inequality of a social status, for example. Um, there's always an inference there or okay there's inequality therefore there must be oppression taking place or mm -hmm. there's inequality and therefore this is an unjust situation purely because there's uh, a type of hierarchy you could say that exists between human beings um, the ayah you mentioned um, there's also a very similar ayah at the end of uh, Surah Al-An'am uh, and it's, there it says that mm -hmm. to test you in relation to what we've given you mm -hmm. which is very interesting mm -hmm. because what that does is it changes the whole perspective because number one you understand that human beings are necessarily going to be different in terms of the stages that they have there is no utopic scenario where everybody's exactly the same in this dunya that doesn't exist and frankly even in the akhirah there's Jannah and his levels and Jahannam is levels right but then at the same time the perspective from an Islamic standpoint changes because it's, well, you have different positions to test you in relation to what you have. Mm. I.e. if you have more money, for example, mm. if you're in a higher situation, mm. then you're at, you're being tested. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a lower situation, then you're also being tested. Are you going to be patient? Are you going to deal with that scenario in a way that a, a believer should? Are you going to accept that things are being qadar and deal with that? If you're rich and you have power over other people, are you going to be oppressive? Are you going to be, you know, uh, abusive and use that power in a way that's negative? So it, it changes the whole thing, and I think that that needs to be uh, understood. I think in this uh... beautiful, and I I think you know that, that what you started off by saying when you were saying that equality discourses, and usually they in modern parlance they differentiate between what's referred to as quality of outcome, um, opportunity and outcome. Say equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. This ayah, for example, is pretty clear to us that uh, actually neither are preferred in the Islamic discourse. Equality of opportunity or equality of outcome, especially equality of outcome, but not just not preferred. I'll go further in this and say it's not, like you said, even feasible. Like this idea of equality, it's very difficult to argue for equality on some grounds and not others. It's very difficult to say, it starts getting murky when you do that. For example, if you say, I believe in equality, in um, f for instance, uh, um, <laughs> no, no, not I was going to say, for example, uh, inequality and in, um, opportunity of uh, people going to work or having the same education, right? No problem, education or whatever it may be. But at the same time, you you don't mind believing in that in the context of a capitalistic society. What well, capitalism, by its by its nature, is unequal. If you're in a free market economy, that means you agree to inequality. If you don't believe, we talked about Marxism, but you believe, and even Marxism has problems with equality, because then now you have inequality between the leader and the people, because now he's going to become a tyrant, as we've seen in history. But inequality is unavoidable. It's inescapable. What I'm saying is, therefore, for example, everyone is, grown, uh, is born in a certain way. Yes, so some of us are born taller, some of us are uh, shorter, some handsome, some not. Uh, <laughs> so what I'm saying is, some of us are born with disabilities. Some of us are born in certain areas in the world. Some of us are citizens of a country which has a high GDP. Some of us are citizens of a country which has a low GDP. These are all realities. Now... There is no equality here. Now, saying that we are all born equal, for example. What do you mean by that? Like, we are all born equal? No, we're not born equal. We're fundamentally born unequal. That is the number one thing that is true. That everything about us is unique. 
from someone else. And that, with unique, with uniqueness, comes inequality. That is a standard rule. You can't have something with... Equality is 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's what equality looks like. But then, unless you are born ex like a twin of another brother, even there's inequality is there. Well, where, 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 may, where may they be? They may be in the, in the fact that now you are born as a twin and someone else is a non-twin and there's inequalities in your, reaction, in your interaction with the non-twins. Like as a twin, you have advantage, there's advantage and disadvantage of being a twin. People might confuse your brother for you, for example. I've even heard some stories about the wife going in and seeing his, yeah, <laughs> with the brother-in-law and, you know. Yes. And the same thing with the husband. Yeah, the, we've seen, so these are all disadvantages. What I'm saying is there are inequalities of everything. So to try and force an equality reality, it's, it's a battle that you will not win. Allah is saying, as the Quran we talked about, that Allah has allowed this to happen. That these inequalities, in fact, they represent points of tribulation. That Allah gives you certain things, gives the other person certain things, and He tests you and He tests the other person with whatever He's given you. Everyone in the world has a specialized test. A kata made test. A tribulation of some sorts. And so you cannot try and bypass this reality by putting in some economic system or something like that. Now having said this, another theological issue The Prophet ﷺ said, He says, Your indentured servants are your brethren, upon whom Allah has given you authority. So if one of you has a brethren under his control, one should feed them with the like of what one eats and clothe them with the like of one, what one wears. You should not overburden them with what they cannot bear. And if you do so, help them in their hard job. Already this hadith dispels the entire narrative of Django and whipping and you know this and that eat feed them from what you've uh, What you eat from for example Clothe them from so it's why clothe them from your own clothes. Why don't give them specialized clothes or specialized food? to try and create harmony and respect and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a feeling of camaraderie and brotherhood This didn't exist in their history nor did they believe in that stuff, to be honest with you. This is not how it operationalized in the West. And this is why it's very important to ask them what they mean by slavery. Because if it's what they went through, then we're not interested in that. Because look at what the Prophet is telling us here. And don't forget, I mean, let me preface all of this, is that the Quran itself has a very clear emancipatory discourse. And we'll talk about that. And I'll talk about the does Islam abolish slavery question because that needs unpacking as well. It doesn't abolish it, but certainly there's an emancipatory discourse. Like for example, the clearest thing that you can imagine is in Surah Al-Balad. What is the good way? Freeing a slave is a good way. So freeing somebody who is under your control is seen as one of the, the best things you can do. But having said that, whilst they're in your control, these are the parameters that you have to deal with. Any questions on this point? Okay, Let's go to the next part. Now, there are many things where manumission or freeing a slave is actually compulsory in Islam. For example, if you killed somebody accidentally, you must free a slave. Breaking an oath, you have to free a slave. The issue of a mukataba, which we'll talk about in a second, and that we've talked about already about this man emancipatory discourse, if dihar, if you mention something to your wife, for example, that she's like the back of your mother or something, you have to free a slave. But the issue of a mukataba is interesting because the Quran says in Surah An Nur, in chapter 24, verse 33, that, فَكَاتِبُوهُمْ إِنَّ عَلِمْتُمْ فِيهِمْ خَيْرًا that, And do mukataba of them, which we'll translate in a second, if you know in them good. I was reading al qurtubis tafsir, I was actually quite surprised to find that he mentioned that some of the Salaf actually consider this to be wajib. 
Meaning that, for example, if somebody says, I want to ransom myself, like a slave comes to his owner and he says, I want to ransom myself for such and such amount of money. Meaning I will work for my, my liberation or my freedom or my emancipation. Now, the four schools of thought say, fine. All four of them say you have to do that so long as there's ijab and qabul. Basically, both of them have to agree and accept. All four schools of thought. However, al Qurzbi mentions that in the, if some, some salaf, he mentions some names of the salaf, tabain and others, even sahaba he mentions, uh, if the slave wants to be emancipated, because, and he makes an interesting argument, he says, فَكَاتِبُهُمْ is amr al amru fil wujub Like he says that, if some people have said that the amr or the, the imperative, it means that it's wajib. Meaning, if they are good people, then you must actually free them. If they want their freedom and they're happy to do ransoming of it. This is an opinion in Islam. And if this opinion is someone believes in that opinion, then the question of abolition becomes actually a serious one. Because if someone says... Does Islam emancipate or abolish slavery? Well, mukataba would actually be a means of abolishing slaves, in a sense. Because if every slave wanted freedom and they were willing to ransom themselves, according to this opinion, then they should be given it by force. By force, according to Al-Khurtubi. So there is one opinion in Islam which at least allows the, the possibility of an abolition. And this is an opinion which goes back to the Sahaba and the companions and the early people. And is mentioned by some of the great giants of Islam. Although it's not represented, I must say, in the four schools of thought uh, very much. Maybe it, should be, it could be by some schools of thought. I haven't done complete, exhaustive research, I have to say, on all schools of thought. But this is what al Khurtubi mentions. And this is very important. Because some people will find that this is a very big shubha for them. And they say, if Islam didn't abolish slavery, then I don't know what to do with this. I thought it morally abhorrent. Morally abhorrent. I say, f first and foremost, this is not an issue like that. Where does morality come from? And we can have a discussion about morality where we can do it another time. But what we're saying is, at least with this situation, there's something to reply. There is an opinion in Islam, which if the slave didn't want to, or the indigenous slave didn't want to be in this position, that they would be forcibly freed if there is ransom, if they're willing to ransom themselves. And they go to the Qadi. They go to the higher authority and say, I don't want to be there anymore. I don't want to be in this house no more. So this is actually a very important opinion which is represented in a book of Tafsir and other, other books. Any questions on that? <clears throat> of course, the emancipatory discourse is even more pronounced. For example, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, this is in Tirmidhi, Surah Tirmidhi. It says, whenever a Muslim man emancipates a Muslim man, he will be given his freedom from the hellfire. He will be rewarded for every, every limb of his in equal measure. Whenever a Muslim man emancipates a Muslim woman, they will be, uh, they will be his freedom for, from hellfire. They'll be rewarded for every limb for equal measure. Whenever a Muslim woman emancipates a Muslim woman, she'll be her freedom from hellfire. She'll be rewarded for every limb of hers in equal measure. And it's interesting that it specified the man and the woman and woman to woman as well. So it's making it very, very clear. This is, it doesn't usually do that, but it shows you uh, something. And in fact, in Usul al-Fiqh, you'll be very surprised. I was looking at some sources. And Al-Qarafi, for example, very famous scholar, before liberalism was even formed, when you ask the question of the attitude of Islam towards ab abolishment of slavery, he says that actually God expects freedom, meaning, and this, uh, yes, in his, in his book, he says that basically, Islam is working towards that. If you think about, for example, zakat. Zakat has eight recipients. One of them is a wafir riqab, slavery, or the, the slaves. So, so long as Islam has zakat. Zakat is wajib. It's, a ruk, it's one of the uh, arkan of Islam. One of the, it's a rukun arkan of Islam. One of the pillars of Islam. One of the five pillars of Islam, zakat. And uh, zakat stops slavery from happening. Oh, sorry, it, you can free the slaves with the zakat money. Which means so long as there's zakat, there's freeing of slaves. So it acts like a sieve. Alongside all of the other things, like for example, we talked about the, um, the, when you're forced to, to, to free a slave and other things as well. Any questions on, on that? No? Okay, good. I think we've, we've covered this before. 
But before we go into arguments, there's there's a few arguments now. So I've, we've made the points. I, w- I want to now present the arguments because <clears throat> there's a few things I've I've been thinking about this. If someone says, well, with all that having been said, I still think it's wrong. I'm sure there's going to be people watching this that are going to say that. Let's be honest. People are watching this right now and saying, okay, well, you've just said everything, but I still don't agree with it. I say, fine. It goes back to our uh, question. Is it... Is it wrong or categorically wrong? All right, so how would, you, how would you address this question? Yeah, same. How would you put this question? Same thing with the issue of the Aisha radiallahu anha. Beautiful. So it's basically, I would ask the question, do you believe then it is categorically wrong or consequentially wrong? So if, it's, if you say categorically wrong, you're basically saying at all times, in all places, in all circumstances, it shouldn't happen. Yeah. Then I would be discussing about, you know, back then, you know, when wars, because sometimes what we do is we use the fallacy of presentism, which is today, you know, if, I mean, back in those days, you go to war and you leave, you've, you've executed these men. And the women and children are there. You're leaving them in the, live, leaving them in these lands where they can get all kinds of stuff can happen to them. So if I ask the question to them, I'm sure they would most likely say, "You know what? The least I would do, it's you know take care of them and you know um, let them join the community." Mm. So those are the two questions I'll ask: categorically or consequentially. So with consequences, what do you think they're going to say? Okay, with the consequences, they might say. You know, you know, you have no ownership. It's a human being. It's a free person, especially living in liberalism and, you know, the the self-centered, um, uh, you know, society that we're living in. So they would be like, you know, why would you have to? Um, the consequences would be that this man is not your property. Okay, fantastic. So, what what would you respond to that? I don't know. You you tell me. I, I'm thinking about it now. Consequentially, no. I mean that one there. I mean about ownership and. Do we own ourselves even? Yeah, but still, again, it's yeah. even if we say, okay, yeah, Allah, God owns us. Um, what, what can we say from that moment onwards? Because we live in a society where they're like, no, nobody should own anybody. No, no, no. It, so forget, we, we won't say, we won't make any claims. If okay. they're saying we own ourselves, that's a claim they've made. They have to now substantiate that. True. O- what is ownership? You have to ask yourself, what is ownership? Yeah, what when, is ownership? When you possess something, right? Now, you can possess something economically. Yes. How else can you possess it? You can possess it physically through tangi- tangibility. Once so again, so we, can, we can say, d- d- define what you mean by ownership. Beautiful. So like for example, your employee, does, do they own you? The, the, the thing is, it's one of the kind of hidden or snuck assumptions or hidden presuppositions of some liberal theorizations is that we own ourselves. Yeah. But the, the problem is actually trying to prove this to be the case. Mm. How do you prove that you own yourself? On what, on what basis do you own yourself? I don't know about owning myself, but I do know I have my freedom. What is freedom? They would say that. No, but the, the, the you have to keep. You have to. Okay, so so questions. let's imagine. Okay, so I yeah. would say personally, yeah. I'm free to leave this very place here, and nobody can stop me. Thing is, for example, <laughs> you, no, <laughs> there is someone that can stop you. No, no one can stop me. Right here. <laughs> 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 I'm only kidding. Yeah. But what I was gonna say is that, for example, there's always parameters, right? There's always yeah. things you can be like. For example, if I go to if I go to work, if I work for nine to five, there's institutions, organizations, there's going to be parameters there. If I don't do X, there's a consequence. If I don't do Y, there's a consequence. Almost everything you do in life has a consequence, has a trade-off. There's someone to impose a cost on you. At what point is that cost enough to call it slavery? That's my question. Okay, so what, what if we say, okay, interesting. So what if we said, let's, let's go back to contractarianism. Yeah. So it, it, it fits into this because they can't come to us with that because we're like, you, you are under a contract. Uh, with this this country, for example, yeah, you will you nobody asked you to. Did anybody come and ask you that if you cross, I don't know, go through the red light, you're not going to get a fine? Okay, but I don't want to describe this because. But doesn't it link? It can, it can do, but it depends on how you make it link. But mm. remember, what you've started off by doing is you asked them, is it cat- your the onus is on them? Because we talked about ownership. The onus is on them. Remember, yes. Don't don't fall into the thing of having to justify. Okay. Let them justify. Okay. Okay. You're asking them, is it categorically wrong or is it consequentially wrong? Okay. Categorically, That's, we know. So categorically wrong, they're going to have to offer some proof for why it's categorically wrong. Yes. Consequentially wrong, what's the consequence? What's, okay. the, what's the bad consequence that we're talking about? If it's saying it's harm, what kind of harm? And why is that harm unimposable on a human being? Mm. At, in all kind of times and places. The, this is the line of reasoning you want to. Remember this categorically consequentialist thing is very, very important. Yes. Because as we mentioned, in Western ethics and in general ethics, if you pick up any book here, of, we've got in the back... Mm. Uh, on ethics, you know, we've got many books on ethics. I don't know where they are. Uh, someone took, <laughs> someone took the books. 
It's there somewhere. Yeah, but if you look at any books in ethics, the three main compartmentalizations are consequentialist morality. What else? Deontological. Deontological. And the third one is? Virtue. virtue ethics. Now, virtue ethics, who, who propounded those? Aristotle. Aristotle, for example, yeah? <clears throat> they, are, they are not prescriptive. That's why there is no government today which is based on virtue ethics. So you're left, you're left with two, which is categorical and uh, consequ consequential. Categorical and deontological are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And consequentialist. So what you're doing is you're showing them these are your moralities. You're going to have to now show your working out. Why are you saying this is wrong? Is it because emotionally wrong for you? Is it an emotional argument? Is it the best emotional argument of human history? Is this what this is? Or is it that you have working out for why this is wrong? Yes. I have a question. So if they were to say harm, it harms the slave emotionally. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, the thing is, this, this point about harm, the question is, how do you define harm? What kind of harm is acceptable? What kind of harm is unacceptable? What kind of harm is imposable? What kind of harm is unimposable? Yeah. And in what circumstances? Because the thing is, anyone can put the harm card. We're seeing it nowadays. We're saying, well, I'm being abused. Why? Because, oh, he said something I don't like. Mm. How, he, yeah. Yeah, because I've had conversations with some liberals, right? And they come back and say, any unimposable harm, which is uh, done from one party to another party without consent, is something that's bad. Why? How do you prove that? I've got no clue. Okay, fantastic. So they can make the claim all they like, make it sound as good as they like. Yeah. But why it's bad, how do you prove that that's bad? That's the question now. Right. Because remember, almost all theoretic uh, theoreticians fail at this point. They f they, the house of cards breaks at this point. You don't have a reason to tell me why that particular thing is wrong. There's many things that happen without consent. Many things. Now, obviously, we believe in a kind of consent theory in Islam. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong, Yanni, from our perspective. But we're not talking about our perspective. We're talking about consent theory. How does it work? Okay, when a child reaches what age exactly? Well, they call it assent with, with children. So why don't we ask a child, so what point does a child become cognizant enough to be able to be self-volitional and self-autonomous? Or, for example, what about a person with dementia or so Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's? Or, for example, what about uh, a blind person that's walking off a cliff? Can I unconsensually push them away? Yes, why? Because the harm is here and the benefits are there. They're always going to change the parameters when you start giving them the rogue examples. Or what about if it's a harm of the kind that you've just mentioned versus equality? Then we've got another issue. Then homosexuality comes out the window because then a, a communal harm or individual harm can, can cause a, more, a bigger communal harm. I'm paying taxes because homosexuals are having intercourse in a society and now they have to go to hospital because now, according to the NHS, they have 10 times more likely to get more diseases than me. It's causing me financial harm. Mm. So then the communi communitarian versus individualistic mm. ethic comes into play. Uh, the, the uh, trends, trends, you know, there was a uh, thing about, you know, they closed down one of these, I don't know, what this trans, this clink, whatever it was. So how is it that they allow a child at an age, I mean, as young as I'm hearing, ages like five, six, to decide that, they can decide if, they're not, if they want to be a boy mm. or a girl. So um, where does it stop? Like you said, yeah the... yeah. the point is, is that when does the harm principle come into play and when doesn't it? They don't have a set of criteria. Like, for example, we as the Muslims, we have Abdarar Yuzel. We have La Darar Wala Darar. No causing harm. No causing harm. But in the context of what? In the context of the Sharia that we know. For example, it's not no causing harm when there's jihad. In fact, it says, Fadribu Fawqal Anak. Kill the person. Well, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. so hard that the, the people behind them, like, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah exactly. Fashadrid yeah. bihim, yani, completely cause. Sometimes you have to cause harm. The question is not harm or lack thereof. It's when do you impose the harm? When is it acceptable to be harmful, and when is it not? Um, <coughs> question here. So, yeah, I think the, with with the Aisha question, uh, this this question here of categorical versus consequential is potentially. Um, it works because the you you can present a scenario, for instance, where a person could imagine that being allowed. Yeah, for example, like a Christian will be able to admit it in certain situations, or uh, in a case of like you know uh, the first people and things like that. 
With this one though, someone says, look, it's categorically wrong in all situations and all circumstances to buy and sell human beings. Okay, fine. I'm, uh, now I want you to tell me why. Because, for example, on Kant's logic, how why? If you guys remember the the thing we've done on deontological ethics, yeah. when did Kant say something was wrong like that? Huh? Yeah. If everyone does it, and it leads to some kind of what? Society. Yeah, societal uh, dysfunction yeah. or impossibility. Now I'm saying that's why he says suicide is wrong. That's why he said lying was wrong. Okay. I'm saying, why is slavery wrong on that basis? Because if everyone has a slave... No, but it can't be. Because the thing is, now tell me if I'm wrong, if everybody acted on not having a slave, there will be dysfunction in society. Back, I'm talking about back then, by the way. Yeah, so that's what we can't say categorically. Because back then, if everyone applied this, you would have women and children starving. It'll have a, uh, it would have a, a massive uh, impact on society at large. So if everybody acted upon it, it, it causes it, uh, the society to be dysfunctional. So therefore, doesn't it go against Immanuel Kant's point that some, not some, but a lot has to indulge in it that when they go to war, when men are killed, these men and women and children are taken. It's as simple yeah, as that. Yeah, that's, these so are categorically, the, no, these but are, consequentially. These are, the, these are the cases against uh, deontological ethics. Yes, yeah? categorically, yeah. But what but about what consequentially? I'm is that even, there's something more apparent to me than that which is that how do you prove the categorical imperative is true as well yeah Can true it, the categorical imperative doesn't come from the skies it hasn't come from a heavenly source exactly My, i don't even believe in the categorical imperative so then that's really where you're going to go because you could make it let's be fair you can make a deontological uh, uh, case you can say what well, if everyone did it how could it's impossible for everyone to do it in the first place how can you be both slave master and slave owner at the same time yeah you, you can make that kind of a case i can see where people are going but what we would say is that even on those grounds even if you believe in this kind of categorical imperative or hypothetical imperative, whatever kind of imperative, we would say those things haven't come from the sky. Yes? Um, if their definition of freedom is like full autonomy over the self without consequences, like someone else, you know, arresting no, something. Well, we say that's impossible. That, that kind of world doesn't yeah, exactly. exist. exactly. So couldn't you say, um, yeah, if, if everyone were to be fully free, then that it's world anarchy. would be anarchy. impossible to live in. What, what you're talking about here is an anarchical state. Right. Yeah, so... And this is, by the way, it's very important because when I was preparing for Jordan Peterson at one point, I was looking at his second book and he was talking about the sovereignty of the individual or something like this, yeah? And many people talk about this as sovereignty of the individual, the sovereignty of the individual. Whereas I think I've got it here, man. I, I, all the books I've, I'm thinking about, I think they're here somewhere. Someone's mo moved them. Yes. Uh, here we go. Beautiful. Fine, finally. Oh. Finally. This book. <laughs> Famous book by Robert Nozick, Anarchy, the State and Utopia. Okay. This is really the closest you're going to get to a world without Ali Dao was talking about the social contract. If this is the closest you're going to get to a world without the social contract, Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State and, the, and Utopia. Now, really, this is what it looks like. And he tells you clearly, look, he even titles his book with it, Anarchy. Now, the thing is with Anarchy is... I am proposing to you, okay, I am proposing to you that in an anarchical state, you still have imposition. So, and remember, we kind of went through this when we talked about this um, social contract. We talked about the fact that social contract is you, you give up some of your freedoms for the protection of the state. Yeah. And that's actually forced upon you, as you mentioned, because when you're born, you no one's asking you to be in a social contract. You're a citizen of this country, you have to obey the laws. You're not given consent. Social contract. Which is a kind of, if you, you can even call this slavery. But of course, we wouldn't. We wouldn't call, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, someone said this is a kind of slavery because you're being forced to follow some laws that you're not, you don't want to follow or you've not been consented. It is. It's a war. In Ukraine, for example, in, in Ukraine, for example, can anyone come and say, yeah. oh, can, men, can all the men come and say, you know what, we choose not to fight Russia. We want to go to Germany. When, when, when your life is on the line, you can start making arguments. But exactly. You so there you go. So you cannot say it's categorically wrong. No, I, that, I wouldn't link it with the categorical consequences because it convolute the point. But I'm okay. saying that on this point, it's a point on and of itself. Okay. The idea of freedom, because now we're talking about the important idea of freedom. We're saying that in the context of how, how can you have freedom? Okay, so in a world where there's a social contract, where there's a government which traps you into following its laws, whether it's constitutional, statute law, common laws, or state laws, or federal laws, or whatever kind of laws, mm -hmm. yes, you are compelled to the social contract. We have to follow the laws. Fine. So if we remove the social contract, what kind of thing do we have? We have this kind of thing. We have anarchy. 
Okay, fine, you have anarchy. But then what happens with anarchy? Because you've now removed the protection of the state. You've now removed the police. Now you've removed the, 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 the military men. You no longer have an army, a standing army. You don't longer have any army. So what, do you, what happens when there is no army? What happens when there is no police? Who takes control? Then you have Hobbes. Anarchy. Anarchy. Now you have Hobbes. Now you have uh, Thomas Hobbes's Lord of the Flies book scenario, which is survival of the fist. Everyone's going to fight everyone. Let's be real. If, uh, yani, we have that world. I'm going to put, put my, the strongest wins. I'll steal, I'll take, and that. Khalas. Yeah, but the, the idea of freedom here is not actually actualized, even in an anarchical state, because in an anarchical state, who is most prosperous are the most strong, the most capable, the most able. This goes back to full circle to what we were talking about before. This idea of freedom doesn't exist in the world that we live in. So there Allah has, i sorry to say, Allah has put things in this world, is dar al ikhtibar the world of tribulation and trials. And as such, it's inherently unequal. You cannot, whatever you try and do, whether you try and impose communism or anarchism, you cannot change the reality of how Allah created this thing. It's a beast of its own. It doesn't accept equality. You cannot impose equality on it. So this idea of freedom and equality are utopian ideas, utopian ideas which don't actually exist in the real world. Whether you decide to have anarchy, then you're going to have me versus you, him versus her. If you decide to have social contract, there's qahr, there's, there's once again, there is jabr or there is compelling. I'm not asked to follow the laws. So w whether you go this extreme to authoritarian rule or that extreme to anarchical rule, it's the same thing here. Any questions here? Before we... Yes. Okay, what, if they, what if they followed the logical conclusion yeah. and said, therefore, anarchy is better than, for example, a social contract? Uh, because morally, I'm fine, now but then, but then, uh, in an an anarchical system, what's possible is that no. the stronger will overpower the weaker. That, slavery is possible. I mean, no, if, it, no, if, there's, if, if, if they say, okay, let's have anarchy, what's going to happen is that's not going to last forever. Uh, what's going to happen is somebody's going to come and set orders and uh, enslave you, and you're going to end up following <laughs> exactly. them. So you're going to go back to square one. So exactly. if they but said there's, that, there's something more than that. The reason why I brought up Jordan Peterson is because he talks about the, the primacy of the individual. Now, you take individual primacy to its logical conclusion, what do you really have? You have anarchy. Why? Because individualism is the freedom of the individual, the primacy of the individual to do whatever he or she wants to do. Uninhibited. Unencumbered. Yes. That's a new one for you, yeah? Put it in the notes. <laughs> Uninhibited. <laughs> Unencumbered, yeah? So what I'm saying is, in fact, Hobbes actually... He, he uses these terms, unencumbered, uninhibited, and so on. This is, what I'm saying is, if that's the case now, individual, one individual does whatever I want to do, whatever she, she does whatever she wants to do, I don't even want a state. Forget about minimum state interference. I want no state interference. Because that's why the Republicans and the right wing guys, they want a small government in America. Because they say that the smaller the state, the more the individual can be this is actually liberalism. That's why neoconservatives in America are not actually conservatives in that sense. They're liberals as well, with a small L. You have to remember the distinction between small L and big L, yeah? So they are saying we want individual. They consider taxation to be theft and so on. Why? Because they're saying we don't even want these guys to get involved in my individual decision making. You see the, the idea? But then if you take that to its logical conclusion, you don't have a social contract, you have anarchy, you have this. And what I'm saying is with that comes its consequences. There, there is no governmental situation that we know we're in which you can actually avoid this level of uh, control. And what I'll say in addition to that is, wherever you go, you're going you're gonna to get an imposition. And that's the world we live in. Everything has a trade-off. It's not even just economic. It's not even social. It's not just uh, societal. It's not just military. You, everything has a trade-off in everything you do. Everything has, well, in economics, it's called an opportunity cost, you know. You've heard. So if I don't drink this, I can drink that. And if I have five pounds, I can either get oranges with it or apples with it or whatever. You can't choose to have Surprise. both. Let's say if it's five pounds, oranges, five pounds, it's yani, the same price and it's the minimum price. I can only choose one over the other. I can't decide to do 15 minutes of walking and 15 minutes of running at the same time at two o'clock at, at, at night or in the morning. Everything has a trade-off. 
If I decide to be too nice with my wife, she'll be disrespectful to me. If I decide to be too disrespectful to my wife, she'll be resentment of me. Everything has a trade-off. You can either make your wife... Yeah, and, and there's a middle ground, of course. <laughs> and there's a middle ground, of course. But what I'm saying is, Yanni, everything, psychologically, emotionally, physically, you can't get away from this reality in the world. It's, it's, it's a fact. Everything has a trade-off. Every single thing has a trade-off. Nothing in this world does not have a trade-off. Everything is attached. There's a price attached to everything. You being here, there's a price attached. You going to sleep at a certain time, there's a price attached to it. You waking up and eating certain food, there's a price attached. Everything, there's a price. Every decision you make, there's a price attached to the decision. Every single thing. That is the, that is the wonder and glory of the world that Allah made. Every single thing, you're accountable for it. And there's a direct consequence in it. For me, that's a wondrous design, actually. It is the highest form AI computer design that you can imagine. There's no such thing, Yani. It's amazing when you think about the khalq of Allah that everything is mash'oon bi'khtibar. Every single thing is, every pixel of the existence has test embedded in it and opportunity cost embedded in it and trade-off embedded. Every single atom, molecule, quark, string, nano, whatever. Every single thing is has test embedded inside of it. So now when you say we want equality and we want to, then you create even bigger inequality sometimes, which is the irony, like with the communist experience, <laughs> with the anarchist experiences. Actually, there hasn't been that many anarchist experiences because this is ridiculous. No one actually does this. And there's never been a state that I know of this, like this, except for the feudal times or something like that, yani, or the caveman times or whatever they call it. <laughs> you know. Anyway, so the, the, the first thing is to go through the... And you can always do this with almost everything. You can go categorical consequentialist. You can go... Obviously, it'll be more effective in some contexts more than others, but you can. It's, when someone's making a moral claim, you ask them what kind of moral claim are they making and to prove it. The burden of proof, is upon the one that's making the claim. Yeah? If someone says it's intuitively wrong in all forms... That's not, a, that's not actually an argument because I can say, oh, it's intuitively wrong that uh, homosexuality is wrong. Everyone has some intuitive understanding of something. Now, if I say, uh, I intuit that homosexuality is wrong. Come on, BBC One. Is that going to be convincing for the British public, for example? I don't think it will be. I intuit. I think it's intuitively wrong. Say, so, okay, well, that's your, that's your opinion. That's what they'll boil it down to. That's your opinion, your subjective value judgment. So fine. If you intuit that indentured servitude or slavery or whatever it is, fill in the blanks, is wrong. It's not an evidence for me. It's not demonstrative. You cannot put it on a board and tell me where it starts and where it ends. And someone will say, well, what about the fitrah then? We're talking about fitrah and we, we don't use the fitrah as an evidence of God's existence. And we shouldn't. We use it an, as an evidence of the natural uh, and cross-cultural and historical and contemporaneous commonality between human beings in that they believe in a teleos or they believe in a god but we don't say this is an evidence for god existing because just because you are born a certain way doesn't mean that it's true that it should be a certain way nor does it mean that it should be the case so using the fitra of some sort as the, therefore god exists it, it would be problematic from that perspective from a demonstrative perspective <clears throat> now i've put some things in place and I want you to remember these and when they finish then we can open it up to the floor Islamic Sharia and put this into maybe an easy format Islamic Sharia allows things which are undesirable to exist to test humans to do away with them we just talked about tests and all that stuff so that's number one Islam allows things to exist which are undesirable poverty is undesirable Islamic Sharia allows poverty to exist yani, let me say for example if you lived in an, an Islamic state. All the zakat is paid. Every single thing. Everyone done their wajib. Is it still conceivable that people will be impoverished and disenfranchised? It is. Yeah, you can still have rajul faqir. You can miskin and all of that. You can have these categories of people. Yeah, and is it desirable? No, it's not desirable. Does the Sharia want it from one perspective? No. But it's testing the people with money to give these people here. Now, I'm, I'm putting forward to you that poverty is like slavery. Yeah, and a cap, we said a capitalistic economy, a capitalistic economy allows poverty to exist. Really and truly it does. I mean, any economy, free market, 
Poverty is possible in any free market economy. And we're living in free market. There's only two or three com so-called communist states in the world today. And they're questionably so. China is not communist. Yeah, we're talking about North Korea and Cuba. I don't know where else, Yanni, to be honest with you. Is there anywhere else that anyone knows? Eritrea. Is, is it communist? I don't know. That's all right. Maybe Eritrea. I haven't, look, I haven't looked at uh, that. But I doubt, I doubt it. I think they're, they're trading and doing all kinds of things there. North Korea. North Korea. North Korea and Cuba, yeah? Apart from those two, I don't know. Like where they're really trying to implement communism, right? But apart from those two places, there's really nothing there. There's nothing there. Every country in the world, there's not an outrage about the issue of, okay, well, this is, these are free market economies and, and poverty exists. Now, of course, you'll find some outrage from communists. Say, so, well, this is the problem. And this, but their solution is also unequal, quite frankly, as we said, that you put what he put. Stalin in charge, then he becomes the big guy. Is there not an inequality there, Yanni? Uh, let's be real and honest. Of course, there's equality, inequality. He owns all the land. He owns all the uh, means of production. There, there is an inequality now. But it's an inequality between the government and the people. You have to admit there's an inequality. You say, no, there isn't. Yes, there is. But you have to allow some level of inequality. And that inequality can create mass death and mass whatever. You can't try and eliminate inequality like that. And what we're saying is so long as you allow some level of inequality through whatever system you have decided, oh, people, whether it's the communist system, the anarchical system, sorry, the anarchical system, the free market system, Adam Smith, John Keynes, whoever, whoever you want from your big guys that you've had from Aristotle to now, every single system in the world that has attempted to do away with inequality has produced a permutated, mutated, different type of inequality. It's removed, it's traded one inequality for another. There's no such thing as a removal of inequality in the world. There's only a substitution of inequality. One form of inequality for another. That's all these systems aims to do. Now what we're saying is that a free market economic system, for example, is a system which allows a certain inequality to happen. It is feasible, it is conceivable, it is possible in a free market system of any kind, of any way to allow poverty to exist. Poverty can happen. Whether you believe in trickle-down economics or whether you believe in uh, Kenyan economics or whether you believe in communism or whether you believe in whatever, anarchy, whatever you believe, social, political, economic models, inequality will happen. So, khalas, Islam, because Islam operates in Dar al-Ikhtibar, where Allah created this world of test, also allows and admits to this kind of inequality. The only way it will be resolved is Yom al-Din. In fact, this is an evidence for the Day of Judgment. Or for the necessity of the Day of Judgment. Because Yom din or the Day of Judgment, comes from the Arabic word Dain, which means debt, actually. And it's as if to say, there will be debts here. This is Dar al-Ikhtibar. In Dar al-Ikhtibar, in the place of the dunya we live in, there are going to be debts. There are going to be unresolved debts. Whether it's sins or economic debts or whatever debts. And there's only one place to resolve those debts, which is in the Day of Judgment. So in a sense, the, the wujud or the existence of inequality of some sorts, it indicates to us that there must be a way of filtering out some of these things that are going to happen. I'm not saying inequality is injustice. Some forms of it are, but some forms of it are not. So Islam is a system which allows this. And I'm saying the same thing applies with slavery. Because we're saying with slavery... Islamic Sharia allows things which are undesirable to exist, to allow humans to do away with them. A zik is also undesirable. No one's going to say a zik, indentured servitude, is desirable, either for the person or for the people. It's not desirable. Why? Because we say that uh, with, with, if it was desirable, why is Islam telling us to free them? If, it was, if, if their situation was a desirable situation. Yani, the person who's indentured and owned, it's, the Sharia wants them to be freed. Let's say. But wants them to be freed in the same way as it wants the impoverished one to be paid. And to be uh, uh, franchised. Let's say. So from that perspective, this is why it's important to talk about it. From that perspective, uh, Islam allows both, but it gives both the impetus. The people the impetus to do away with both. And this goes in line with the motto of trying to resolve the, uh, the issues there. And then when you talk about another kind of argument is 
when you look at the war that took place in, in America, I mean, did it really help? The question is like now in 1861 to 1865, when these wars took place. Now, some historians argue that the war took place because of slavery or other reasons and all these kind of things. We'll leave that discussion to another day. But the point is, is it worse to do away with slavery incrementally? Is it better to do away with slavery incrementally or to do it one go? And we've seen every time America tries to do something in one go, it goes wrong. The abolition. They tried to abolish uh, alcohol in one go and it went completely wrong. For example, they tried to do the same thing with slavery. And what happened? The worst war in American history. Probably more pe black people died and more impoverished people and more northeastern people died in that war than any other war in 11 wars that America took place part in. So is someone, what's worse now? Someone being uh, in a, sla a slave situation or them dying? Yani, remember, they, they had to use them as uh, the slaves. They had to use them as, 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 as fighters. So... Is, is the death of one, where's the ratio? At what point is the ratio? So the death of maybe 10 for 100 free slaves? Yeah, and if someone said to you, had a piece of paper in front of you, said, look, we're going to go and get involved in a war right now. And for every 10 people that die, 100 slaves are going to be alive, uh, freed. Is it, is it worth it? I would say, no, it's not worth it. I don't want anyone to die. Well, one person uh, to 100 is not even good for me. For example, for, uh, subjectively. But some will say maybe one is okay. But do they want to, and then we can go into discussion, do they want to die or do they not want to die? Or is it, no, they don't want to die. So one person involuntarily dying, so let's say one black slave in America involuntarily dying, so we can free a hundred of them. Is it worth the deal? Some will say yes, some will say no. We would say this is not the way the Sharia put forward. And there's a reason and wisdom for that. You don't sacrifice death for this kind of thing. Sacrifice people on, the, on chopping board dying and stuff like that. No, I don't even know what the numbers of people that died in American uh, Civil War, but I think it's the most ever of any war they've ever engaged in. And it was in the 1800s. Can you imagine? So if, if, if that's the case, this is a seriously, this is a failure. They think, and they come as a European savior and the, and the white savior and the American savior. You have a failed model. You, how many people died in your war? And after, we're talking about as if, oh yes, but after that we had... Uh, Abolition of slavery and we told you guys to abolish the slavery. No, you didn't have abolition of slavery. You just had it take new forms, illegal forms, human trafficking. Now you've got people in... Tell me what really the difference is between human trafficking and slavery. In this country, that's something called the Slavery Act. Also, um, a lot of things that I was... I was yeah. I was watch, watching a documentary and this documentary talks about uh, inmates in prison. A vast... Like they, they get them to do like to certain like airlines. Exactly. It's a you know, they, if you think about it, they, yeah, actually, they, they, get, they get paid, I think like... I don't know, 20 cents for, uh, uh, literally, that's, it's, it's literally slave work, bro. Exactly. And they have no choice but to do it. Exactly. You know, and that's what they do. Like for certain companies, bro, they're, they're sewing, making stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, airways, etc. So you're thinking to yourself, it's just coming from a different form. Exactly. That's what it is. It's just changed form. Yeah, it's just changed form. But what we're mm. saying is that they get to, t they get to define. Sorry, do you want to say? No, the, uh, the Americans, the, the American prison system is like a, it's like a chain gang. You know, they make the number plates for the, uh, the company yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it does and you know what's funny is if you think about it it's institutionalized because in the context of um you look at like the black african americans yeah the amount of time they get compared to a caucasian man it, it might be different exactly. so they, but they, the point yeah. is, is as if they've got the system ready like yeah lock him up for 10 years yalla give him <coughs> so he can do the job of uh, what slaves would do like back in the day you know and uh, and they would be there working for cheap labor mm. oh. and, and then if you think about it from a geopolitical perspective yeah. as well because we're thinking within the country. Let's think outside of it. When, when America has the uh, International Monetary Fund and it gives uh, African countries, sub-Saharan African countries, certain loans which have cert huge uh, interest rates, yeah. which means that some kid is going to you know, do coal mining for the rest of his life or for the, at least the next 20 or 30 years. Is that not a kind of slavery going on? So the question is, at what point, who gets to define the slavery thing? And at what point is it slavery? At what point is it not slavery? So this idea is that we abolished slavery. No, you didn't. You just have it now in a different form. Exactly. One or it depends on how you're defi defining it. One other, one other thing. You know when you mentioned white gold? Yeah. That's why I put my hand up. I thought you was talking about something. Recently, a documentary came out. It's, it's actually called White Gold, I think. Really? So you know these devices that are made for the batteries for like Tesla oh, oh, and this okay. company? Have yes, you seen yes. it? it? They call it White no, Gold. No. This guy actually went to a part of Africa and he said, like, it's, it's like there was like 30,000 people literally, wow. bro, they are digging with their own hands Some to power. get this specific material. I don't know what it is. Lithium. Is it lithium? Lithium and cobalt. Yes, yes, yes. I think it's one of those two, yeah? Yeah. Bro, 
And it's like nobody's talking about it. What is no it? one's talking about it because the transnational companies yes. are doing it. And remember, if you get if you go in the wrong side of the transnational companies, Oof. you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. So look, I mean, this idea of we've abolished it. I mean, let's let's be honest. If uh, some some of the slaves that existed in some parts of the world, in some uh, uh, empires, they'll be well, looking they'd at prefer that over they'll thing. be they'll be looking at these people in sub-Saharan Africa. They're looking at these people in the sweat factories in uh, the Philippines or, or in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh in particular, right? And they'll be saying these people have very difficult conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They may be. Yeah. In yeah. some parts of uh, some part of uh, history, there's some indentured servant that lived for example the mamalik the mamalik of the, the, the yeah the, the the mamluks of the, the there was two there was one in india one in egypt yeah. these guys were, became the, the leaders of the country if they were to look at these guys or the um, <laughs> the garrisons of the ottoman empire yeah. for example if they were to look at these people in the sweatshop say these are the slave classes i don't this is not even <laughs> slave classes what is this what is this so the idea is some people just because of the term the label overrides the reality sometimes and that's why when we're talking about these issues, we have to really be honest and open and we have to break it up and flesh it out as I hope we've done today. It's a very technical issue. Any other contributions before we end? Sorry, Muhammad. Uh, is it true that if... Um, I think there's a hadith where if you strike a slave, then you have to set them free. Yeah. Yes, so, it's true, yes. Yeah. So yes, it's true, yes. In the yes. Islamic uh, system, yeah? Absolutely. And uh, there was a time when, when uh, they couldn't find slaves to free because... Uh, you know, in in the uh, in in uh, Medina or Mecca, I think there was a time when the the slaves were being freed so I think it's swiftly. The time of Amr Abdul Aziz. Um, yeah, it might be the time of Amr Abdul Aziz, but absolutely. Mm. Like uh, he himself, Amr Abdul Aziz, he you know, there's a famous story of him um, being asked to do a khutbah, like a sermon about giving freeing slaves, and he deferred it for a very long time. And they asked him, why did you defer? He said, because I had some slaves that I wanted to free first before I did it. They did the khutbah so that I don't fall into the hypocrisy of telling people to do something which I haven't done myself. So this, this has always been part of the discourse from the early days in Islam. And whatever we want to compare, whatever parameters we want to compare, it's uncomparable. And there's no moral case to be made against it anyway. And this doesn't prove anything. It's just in a very strong emotional argument, especially when people see images and they hear stories it's a very strong emotional argument, but all of those emotional arguments are non-issues for us. I think I feel like uh, yep. um, if, I, if I was uh, pro slavery, yeah, I would be disappointed because I, there's no way I can find a way to slave someone nowadays. Actually, I was thinking about it, like, what's the is there any legal way? Yeah, it's it's just get own, own a transnational corporation and get people to depend no, no, from, on from your from money. Islamic, from Islamic point of view, is, is there any legal way to slave someone? No, it, it's a good point. So it's, I'm happy you brought it up. Actually, there isn't actually a way to bring because if you can't bring someone who's free, let's say, yeah. or at least is not enslaved in indentured servitude, into being a slave, the only way of doing mm -hmm. it is through uh, war and so on. But that is. Uh, that's not a yani, organized uh, mm -hmm. thing. And some scholars, like uh, even Ibn Baz, he mentioned, Ibn Baz, one of the Salafis of, you know, of our times, one of the great Salafi scholars, he mentioned when he was asked, like, should we bring slavery back in if we go into war and we take it? He said, uh, no. He actually said, because we don't want to open a door that's already been closed. So even at that level, you know, people are saying that we wouldn't do, uh, do that. It's like, it's like a diesel Pardon? Yes. Once you go electric, you can't go back. No, no, no. You, you can feel how the government is slowly implementing rules that exactly eventually it will become all electric. Uh, yeah, and a, then, good point. I mean, imagine if they said to it, look, all your cars today, we're not going to have any CO2 yeah. emissions. We're going to go for the electric cars tomorrow. There will be protests tomorrow outside the embassies. So, yeah, I think Islam is, uh, I feel like it's, it's abolishing or abolished or used a strategy it, to. Yeah, it's, it's a slow process and it's, it's relying on human goodwill, a lot of it. It's not just relying on the state, the state, the state. Because why do you think the state should do everything? Any? Yani, it's, does Islam em say emancipate slaves? Yes, it does. But it says it to the people rather than the state. And if people really felt strongly about it, a whole community of people felt strongly about slavery, then it shouldn't be a problem. Everyone should free the slave. That's finished. And with that, we conclude. And hopefully you've taken some benefit. I surely have. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.